what I realized over time, there's no difference between miracles and magic. It's just depending on who the population is that's engaging with this beautiful, benevolent, um, invisible force that happens on the other side. I hope you will consider joining me for Rebirth 2023, my most popular annual course. It kicks off on January 16th, and over two weeks, I will be bringing you various teaching modules on renewing your soul and charting your path. The experience includes exclusive channeled transmissions from my guides, the Z's, many delivered live, Qigong from Stephen Washington, a live Q&A, a community forum, support resources, and some special guest teachers and bonus content. To learn more, see the link below and use the code IMPACT10 for a 10% discount. Welcome to Impact the World, and if you are regular to the show and you enjoy it, it really helps us reach more people if you subscribe or rate or review, so thank you for doing that. Today's guest is Corin Grillo. Corin has just released a book called Angel Wealth Magic, and a few years ago she released a book called The Angel Experiment, and that was the first time I had heard of Corin and her work. She comes from a background as a psychotherapist, but knew that her calling as someone to speak about and teach about our connection to angels and the spirit world was something she couldn't ignore. And so in today's conversation, we not only speak about angel wealth magic and our relationship to money and how it needs to shift and heal and evolve and what her book can share about that, but we also speak about Corinne's own journey around owning her work, owning her gift, and bringing that to bear in the world of psychotherapy and the world at large, and how she felt about that and how she navigated getting through that. So it's a lovely conversation. Corinne has a delightful energy, and there's lots to enjoy in this show. So you can find Corinne at corinnegrillo.com, and as ever, we will put links to her work in the show notes. But for now, enjoy today's episode. Corinne, thank you for being here. It's We have known of each other for about three and a half years, but we've never actually met in person. So it's lovely <laughs> yeah. to have you here and thanks for coming. Oh, it's so great to be here, finally, right? You yeah. just released a book and we're going to talk about, you know, your journey and your work in general. but. When I saw your latest book, I was really happy to see the title. So yeah. your first book came out a few years ago and it was called The Angel Experiment. And we're both with New World Library, the wonderful mm -hmm. New World Library. Yeah. But your newest book is called Angel Wealth Magic. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing what, what I believe to be paradigm shifting titles mm. where certain words are put together that we often don't expect to see. And I do know that our relationship to money is one that needs healing, both on a personal level and a systemic level. Mm -hmm. So the timing of Angel Wealth Magic just feels perfect. And I, I've read something that you've written and it's wealth magic is not woo woo, which yeah. I completely uh, believe. And I'm sure many of our listeners and, yeah. and uh, watchers will feel too. But perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on why Angel Wealth Magic? Well, over you know my, over the years i feel like magic in anything mystical or quote unquote spiritual has gotten a bad rap and it's been either suppressed demonized or just kind of uh, marginalized into this other realm when in reality our ancestors all of our ancestors no matter where we're from on the planet have always used some kind of magic, some kind of ally, invisible ally, to help us not just survive, but thrive. And it's time, I feel, for us to kind of deconstruct the myth that these things are marginal mm -hmm. when they've been essential for most of our people for thousands of years. What do you think people's reaction is in the world when they hear the word magic? If they aren't like people like us or many of the people yeah. watching, like what do you tend to experience when you bring up the word magic to 
yeah. people who perhaps have some of those views. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting because I was shocked when I even started just working with angels and not using such provocative language. I didn't know it was provocative. I was a little naive. Even talking to angels can be perceived as something that is provocative to some people. So on the worst case scenario, you know, some people just think even talking to angels is demonic. So imagine you add a magic to that and you know, you know, is this is this evil? And that is one of the main questions people ask and have always asked me when I started shifting into more of the spiritual work and moving away from just strict psychotherapy is, is talking to angels evil? And that it was an authentic question. And to be honest, that question has always touched me in a very sad way mm. um, because of the profound blessings that I've received in my life, the profound healing, and also the literal miracles that happen in my life and in the lives of the folks that I serve. So, and, and the thing is, I don't like to answer that question for people. It's not my decision, you know, I don't, but I always want people to really come to those conclusions on, on their own. And I just give them the information and empower them to be, you know, to just feel into it. Does it feel right inside? Does it feel, when you hear about angels, do you kind of lift up? Do you perk your ears? Um, and, and yeah, so magic itself for me, um, what I realized over time, there's no difference between miracles and magic. It's just depending on who the population is that's engaging with this beautiful, benevolent, um, invisible force that happens on the other side. Mm. And when you were working in psychotherapy, what was the moment? Well, I, I should actually ask when you went into psychotherapy, were you already having spiritual connections with angels and, and intuition or did that come later and okay? Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always been open spiritually and I've always been kind of interested, attracted, but it was a miracle, like literally a, a miracle happened and my first book is about that. They talk about that story. A miracle happened and I kind of opened up to the spiritual world in a very palpable, profound way. And, uh, and then from that, and I was a psychotherapist at the time, and it was very awkward <laughs> to be so traditionally trained as a psychotherapist. But after that miracle happened and I started really engaging with the angels on my own, it was like my little secret, my, my hush hush secret. Uh, because when your friends are a lot of therapists and you say, hey, I saw this and I witnessed this and then I felt these vibrations all over my body, um, they might hospitalize you and right. <laughs> give you some, some medication for that. So it took me a while to come out of the angel closet. And, um, and, but when, after the miracle happened, I would feel angels come into the room with my clients who are suffering and have to try to navigate, like, do I say, do I say the angels are here? Am I allowed to see that as a therapist? So it was this whole process of me owning the truth for me and inviting other people. So eventually what I would say is, okay, this is gonna be weird, but I have something weird. You wanna try something a little weird? Because there's, you know, and I would say something about, I, uh, there's a message coming through and, and do you mind if we do a little energy work with angels? And no one ever said no, and it didn't matter if they were atheists or religious, no one ever says no to receiving a message of love. And it took me a while to finally take that leap. And when I did, that's when amazing things started happening. And then people would fly, fly their parents in and you know, things, things like that. So yeah, therapists don't usually have that experience. Brilliant. So yeah, so when we, I, for me, it was just owning who you are and uh, just saying the truth of my experience and inviting people to heal in a different way. It's interesting because we've spoken about a couple of the things that are barriers for people, whether it's their own religion or the way that they think about the world will, will stop them feeling open to language such as angels or magic. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm curious for you, I know that many of us who have ended up working in this field. Mm -hmm. You know, we were students in this field and most of us didn't think this could be our work. But, you know, most people I speak to didn't think, oh, I'm going to be an angel reader or an <laughs> oracle card creator. So I'm always fascinated by, I feel some of the societal stigmas that we each carry individually and that we have to work through. Mm 
in order to stand for this work publicly and do it. Do you have, was, was there something that came up for you as either your imposter syndrome or your I shouldn't do this? I'm wondering what, what would you say was one of the main hurdles you had to overcome to stand for what you stand for today? I, because when you spend ten thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on an education, and then you go through thousands and thousands of hours after that to get licensed, I, my biggest fear was not being taken seriously mm. and being, um, yeah, rejected or uh, by my peers. And so when I started shifting in that direction, I did get, uh, I mean, I was judging myself for it, to be honest. I'm like, look, guys, I know, um, but I just have to start talking about angels. And uh, the people who did have a problem with it, strangely, within probably three or five years, they want to know, like, what are you doing? Because I get, I'm getting happier and happier. Um, talking to international audiences, what am I doing? I'm owning who I am and what I do. And it's been this, and I didn't realize this at the time, but a process of deconstructing the indoctrination about what a valuable human is supposed to do in these little boxes of career and mm, psychotherapy, so practical. Everybody understands that. You talk about angels, and this was back, not, you know, I feel like the spiritual thing has kind of opened up a lot more these days, but back then I didn't really know anybody who was doing the work, and it really was just me on my own figuring it out. But, you know, all of us, when we get that call, what you're really up against is generations of indoctrination mm. against the truth. And the truth is, all over the world, Every society today understands that there is some invisible experience. It's just, if it's not specifically uh, an organized religion, we're shamed for it. Mm. And, and I think the more that we own that, um, the better. And again, it took me years to kind of figure out, why, does this, why is this so challenging? Why is this so hard? And it's, you know, it, that's why people think it's evil and it's, it's just our indoctrination. So true. And, yeah. and so us moving from this linear fixed yeah. society to a more multidimensional society where yeah. we can be holistic about everything. We and can be. And it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful because I feel like when we're open up to different perspectives, we can receive each other's medicine. Yeah. You know, we're carrying these beautiful insights. And how are you going to get the full picture of the diamond if you're only looking at it from one facet? So we get to share and and kind of validate and learn. And, and that has been an important process for me in deconstructing my own, um, how I view things and really making me more open and receptive and also more activated to speak out when the rigidity is harming us. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You brought up shame and in your book, uh, it's really interesting. You, you talk about wealth angels and you talk about wealth demons that we can all have. And, um, y you know, I'm quoting from your book here, but you say, well, the Lord Satan of all of the wealth demons happens on the inside and it's called shame. Mm. And as soon as I read that, I'm like, well, you know, of course. And, and so can you elaborate? Because we've just touched on the shame that we can have, mm -hmm. those of us who own this work, stand for it in our communities mm -hmm. or perhaps even do it publicly. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you discovered around shame being one of the blocks to our abundance. Yes, and it, it took me a while to realize that, and, but through speaking with a lot of people wanting to do this work and me kind of helping usher them into owning it, I, I found it was sh them being either ashamed of themselves for wanting to do the work period or ashamed of themselves for wanting more because a lot of heart-centered people judge themselves if they want money and um, because they've made a separation in their mind between spirit and money and that's again this generational what I perceive as generational lie against what spiritual is and what spirit told me when I'm writing this book is to make it very clear that spiritual power is at the same level as economic power and this time at the planet, when it's so important for us to rise in our passion and in our power to shift the balance into a more heart-centered, 
um, compassionate place. But who's going to do that if not the heart-centered people? And heart-centered people often feel shame when they want more because they're generous. Mm. But that's why I'm saying if you notice that you're ashamed to raise your rates or claim something a little bit more in life, you have to look at the demon for what it is and not let it trump your experience. Uh, especially have a, if you have a calling and you want to get out of a J-O-B and you want to bring something beautiful, you want to do something of service that might be a little out of the box, but it's really cool to you and people de dig it because we're not here to please everyone. And I think the second that we learn, we're not going to please everyone. There's going to be some people that are going to sling their, their crap at you no matter what you do then you might as well have fun doing it and you might as well, you know, help some people the way that you want to help um, that probably people don't see very often. Uh, so shame, yeah, it's, the, it's a big one and it's attached to so much of our stuff, our visibility complexes, the, I, I don't like cameras, you know, I don't want to see myself and yeah. that was me too. I had to yeah. work through all of these hurdles. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we don't want visibility. Oh, I don't like sales and marketing, oh really? Or are you just ashamed to ask mm. for something? Are you ashamed to ask? Um, oh, I'm shy. I'm introverted. Mm -hmm. Are you really? Or is it shame that's really stopping you from just exposing yourself a little bit more? Yeah. So many things you said just popped for me. But one very concrete example of what you're talking about that I have gone through, we're sitting right now doing this show, which is a show that I fund with the profits that my business makes from the channeling work, the teaching work. Mm -hmm. um, nobody works on my show for free and it's something we invest in. It's not something that makes us money, it's something we spend money on because yeah. we're passionate about what oh. we do. And, and so the, the reason I'm sharing that because it's a very concrete example oh. of, and I, can, I could give you so many stories of the years I've gone through of like that discomfort of when I used to do private readings and that was pretty much all I did. And then that was the core of what I did. Mm -hmm. Every time I'd raise the rates, I would go through all kinds of stuff in myself. But mm -hmm. every time I realized it wasn't about me mm -hmm. uh, and about what I wanted to earn. I mean, on some level, you need to be able to pay your rent, mm -hmm. but it was actually about serving a bigger mission. And, and I think there is always something that we don't tend to see whenever we're pushing up against those growth edges. We get very fixated on what we're stuck on. But what my guides were always telling me is pushing through this is going to give you so much more and connect you to so many experiences you can't even understand right now. And so it's, it's having, I think, that trust and that surrender to the growth process too that, that you really talk about so well in angel wealth magic, particularly around our relationship to spirituality and money and how we don't need to separate them in the way that we have been trained to separate from money. Thank you. I'm getting so many chills. I just, oh, I love it. Um, yeah, there's something that I didn't say in the book, but one of the, you know, because like I said, when I was doing this work, I was felt very much on my own, just kind of listening to my guidance and taking so many leaps of faith. And it's a giant leap of faith to raise your prices. Okay. Yep. It's the same. It, when you grow, it's probably the same leap of faith that you take to, I'm going to invest in this show. It's just still very yeah. triggering. But what Spirit showed me in the beginning was, let's not assume that our dreams are our dreams. Let's, let's kind of see, and I didn't know this until I really saw it, is that my dream to start talking about angels, even it was, it was awkward, it was impractical, I had a great career as a psychotherapist. You know, it's like, ah, mwah, I've arrived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, have you really? <laughs> um, but, but they said, your dream, your impractical dream, this bizarre thing that you want to do, may not be your dream at all. It could be spirit dreaming through you, the medicine dropping in that you are to share. And so it's spirit's dream for you, but it's also these people who have come to get that specific medicine from creator through you, it's their dream too. And so when we hold back, we're holding back creator's dream and their dream, even though it feels like the most selfish, weirdest thing that we are doing, like our selfish dream, who do I think I am? Well, it's not about you. And when we realize we're here for other people, 
then we get out of this narcissistic collapsed state of I'm not good enough because believe it or not, spirit showed me that's, that's selfishness mm -hmm. when you're not sharing the medicine, mm -hmm. when you're hoarding it. Well, a great example yeah. of that, I guess, is, you know, when, when, and, and I completely identify with many times in my life, and yeah. I'm sure many will, where, oh, I want, I want love. I want a romantic partner. Yeah. And in our mind, we're thinking about why we want it or what, whereas actually the beneficiary of us finding that romantic partner is the other person yeah, really. who are having their own experience of this relay yeah. of love and togetherness. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, that's, that's beautifully put and so true. Like it, if you believe in a individual, individual universe, then you aren't gonna see the connection of everything that you're really describing. So yeah. Yeah. tell us a little bit about, cause I know writing a book is a process, mm -hmm. especially, I'm assuming this was a written book cause I've done books that we've transcribed from audio, but I'm assuming you yeah. literally sat down and you were like, okay, I need to map this out. Is that how it worked yeah, for you? Yeah, well, the original concept of the book came from uh, during COVID, I stopped a portion of my business to take care of my two children mm. because they're all of a sudden at home. And I needed to hack the system to kind of cover that without worrying about it. So I developed, um, there's an 11 day ritual at the end of the book. So I developed that and I did that process and, <laughs> and it worked. And so uh, when I was giving my offerings to spirit at the end of the day and just my mind was blown, um, I realized that the reason it worked was that I wasn't meant to hoard the medicine and that, you know, there might be a book coming. And so I started, you know, considering it. And then I did have to reverse engineer the, 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 pro the process because I don't just want to give you 11 day ritual if you don't have some of the foundations mm -hmm. that I've already worked through at a certain level. So I gave, you know, then I kind of added a, a lot of other little uh, insights and and meditations and and um, activations, journaling and things like that to help build a strong foundation so that when they plant these seeds of wealth, that they're more likely to grow. And what surprised you? Because I often think we set out on this. Oh, I'm going to do a book or I'm going to do a course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what you know? Is there anything that either in the process of making the book surprised yeah. you or a revelation that you? received or, or, or were able to put in the book that surprised you? Interesting question. I, I think, yeah, I think, you know, I, the surprise always for me comes after the book is done and how it's received. Cause I'm, um, I, I'm not an, I, I don't consider myself an extrovert. Um, and I'm very shy about my work secretly just to myself but I still share it. You do it anyways, right? I got to share the medicine. Yeah. So I'm always shocked that there's an aspect of me that when I'm creating something, it's going to be the worst thing I've ever done. It's just part of, there's a voice in there that's like, this is going to fail. And so, so with this book, I'm like, can I even write, can I even map this out in a way that's comprehensible? Are people going to even receive it? Cause I don't run anything by anyone. I'm just like, here's the book publisher. Hopefully you like it. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, I think that's it is that people understand, you know, people have really had profound experiences, not even just with the ritual yet, just from the beginning, the lights turning on for him mm. about things. And, and I think that's the thing that always surprises me when people love, love, love it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a relate to that. And I've be heard that from so many of us who have put things out really? into the world. Yeah. It's so interesting. Cause I, I think it goes back to what you were saying that, what we're creating, especially if it's something we want to share, comes from the heart. Is, is it comes from the heart, but yeah. it's also being created for a calling out there that we maybe aren't even aware of until it intersects with the people it's supposed to intersect mm -hmm. with and, and gives them that energy. I don't know about you. I always feel like even this show, I know we're recording this a few weeks ahead of release. Mm -hmm. I always feel like when I'm creating something that's going out to people in the future, my whole energy moves to that moment or to the future or even though it's just you and I and our studio mm -hmm. crew here, our small studio crew, mm -hmm. I feel the people right now who will be listening to this, watching this because they're in the room with us in a way influencing it. I always feel that. I don't know if you do. Yes. I mean, I am constantly shocked sometimes by how if I do things in, in advance, how on point it can be 
for the energy of the time or for what what is happening. But yeah, I, I, I just, because I, I think because I have to know, I, for me, it's just I have so much trust in spirit. So in the beginning, it was like, okay, I'm going to do this, but my, my human yeah. is not into it. <laughs> I'm just like, this is atrocious and terrorizing. Um, but because I've gone through the stages enough, I know that I'm just going to kind of punch myself a little bit in the head now, just a couple knuckles, okay? Not both hands and in a ditch kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, it it's it's amazing when you, on the other hand, still let yourself surrender to the process and you see like, God, how, I guess, how supported we are. Mm and how dialed in we are even in our foul moments mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. It's funny, my guides have said to me that it's often on the day that you feel the worst, feel the lowest, that the most major things are going on behind the scenes yeah. it, that you can't even see, and, and that resonates for me. Oh gosh, so yes, so much yes. And I, I tell people this all the time that I'm coaching as well, because some of them are very ashamed of themselves mm. when we're going through this process, they, they commit to creating this and they're gonna do this and this and this and then uh, let's say they stopped drinking for a year and they start boozing it up again mm -hmm. and they share it with me after time because it takes them a while to come in and tell me the truth and then they're shocked when I go, good for you, you're getting close. <laughs> oh, you're 16 again? Mwah, genius, this is gonna be very successful. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep going. That's where we need a coach or a mentor or someone to help, oh, I know this wall. I know this demon really well. Come on, let's go. You know, and you just push him along, but yeah. And that yeah, also comes from our indoctrination because I feel like as a society, we're still fairly new to speaking about the ups and downs of life, the process, trauma. You know, I grew up in that time where we were very much focused on hero worshiping certain people's success, but yes. we never really heard what they were going through behind the scenes or how to get there. Exactly. And so there is this indoctrination even in the spiritual world of, Especially. oh, you must always be light. And it's like, well, no one's always going to be light. And how do you become more light by transmuting your dark? And so yeah. it is going to be this dance that yeah. we go through. But you said it so well when you said about, you know, I'm, I'm just better at knowing I might knuckle myself a few times. I think that is one of the things that the more you create, the more you get used to that process. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you don't have it, it's mm -hmm. just that a bit like someone who goes to the gym for the first time in their life and goes, oh my God, I'm nearly dying. <laughs> someone who's gone for four years knows they're gonna be days they're not in the mood or there's gonna be days that it hurts, but yeah. because they know the mm -hmm. shadow side of it, mm -hmm. they're not as spooked by it or as shocked by it or willing to stop. They'll carry on and push through. And I think that's what creators learn. It's like we all have our stuff and it's learning to manage it the more we s kind of surrender to that process yes yes um yeah thank you for saying that because and i i feel like especially in the spiritual world because um we feel there's many even spiritual leaders who feel like the only face that they can show is this face of everything's great you know but yeah. i know a lot of these people and everything's not great and i want more of us to know that no one has their act together 100%, mm -hmm. but we're, you know, we have the human and also we have who we're here to serve. And again, we don't have to be perfect. You're never gonna feel 100% cooked. You're never gonna feel 100% ready. But if you hear it and you feel it, you know, go in that direction. And when you get that resistance, know that you're right on point. You're right, right in the pocket of all the other most amazing leaders that you admire across the globe. So true, yeah. so true. <laughs> I, I did a radio show about 16 years ago with another channeler, spiritual author. And what we would do is we would share our process and what we were going through and what we were learning from and what we were struggling with. And then we channel. We got so much abuse like on email from people going, oh, just channel. We don't want to hear what you're going. You know, there was this this because there were certain members of the channeling community in 2006, mm. 2007 wow. who wanted the human edited out. And while I can understand that, while I can, you mm -hmm. know, basically my argument was, well, great, go to the people who are, who are just channeling and you never know anything about who they are as humans. There's loads of them there. Go go to them. Yeah, we're doing right. something a little different. So yeah. it's interesting that 
I, I know that one very well. Yes, yes. There's some, yeah. The spiritual bypass, I think it's one of my hot button issues right now where um, I'm actively working <laughs> to, yeah. to speak more on, on that. And that's why embracing the shadow, embracing the darkness is so important because it just helps us be human and also own our gift at the same time. Definitely. Yeah. So your kids, how old are your kids? Uh, one of them just turned 18. I have an oh, adult daughter. Wow. Congratulations. Amazing. I know. So wild. That was fast. Um, and uh, 11 year old. And mm -hmm. how, what did they think about mom's work? <laughs> They're so bored with me all the time, <laughs> right? It's uh, a tough question. It doesn't question. matter what I do. Huh? Well, isn't that the truth for all parents, yeah. right? Especially once they hit the teenage years, they don't want anything to do with you or to know about you. But I'm curious, like what, what's because they're younger, so they're also growing up in a very different time mm -hmm. that's less indoctrinated around mm -hmm. this stuff. Yeah. What's their relationship to spirituality, angels, magic? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, I, I don't, um, I, they know what I do, but I, I make a point to not, try not to give them a belief system, but to give them things to play with when they want it. So when they're in a pinch, they come and ask me, right. hey, what do I do? Okay, well, let's create your own ritual. Let's call in, who do you like? Do you like the, the birds, <laughs> the trees, the sky? Like, what, what, you know, where do you feel like you want to talk? You know, so they talk to angels, of course. Um, but, you know, there are many allies. And we're also unique because I was not a religious person. I didn't grow up with parents that had angels and talked about angels. So my assumption is we're all here designed at a soul level for specific, for different kinds of medicine. Mm. So I just kind of say, hey, here's, here's the container. There's so much to play with. And, um, and so, so yeah, because it's my, my, what I do for a living, I don't want to turn them off to it, yeah. you know? So, so um, they use, they, they, they know what's going on. You'll see them light a candle, take themselves to, to the bed, go take a bath, put some herbs in there, you know? So they, they do some intention and prayer and stuff like that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. You also just shared with me before we got started that you have, you've done something that a lot of spiritual people often have as a goal or an aim. You have a retreat center in, of all places, Mount Shasta. So how did that happen? Oh, God. <laughs> that, it was like a big blur. Um, I took a group down to uh, Peru to do some shamanic work. And I was talking to one of the mountains. I talked to a lot of allies. Um, and the earth is really important to me as well as angels. Uh, so I was connecting with this, this mountain. And down there, they call it Apu, you know, Apu spirit. And I realized I, I love taking people on um, journeys and, and the, intimate, the intimacy. Um, Peru is a long haul. So I asked the mountain, hey, can you find me a friend uh, <laughs> over in the United States that I can take people to who can't travel abroad for whatever reason or another? And then within a couple of weeks, I had an acquaintance friend of mine that I hadn't talked to in years. I got an email from him. It was this group email. And they said, hey, is anybody looking for a retreat center in Mount Shasta? And I was like, Mount Shasta? Yeah, that's an Apu. That's, you know, a great, powerful mountain spirit. So I decided to go look up there. And I had been there once 10 years before. Not much happened. I went this time. I look at, I see the mountain for the first time. The clouds parted and I could see it in tears. And I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm finding a place here for sure. So that's how it started, I realized like, oh, it's only four hours away from my house. It's pretty, pretty reasonable. And how does it feel if it wasn't something that you were thinking about necessarily, but now, now it's there and it's in your world? Like, well, well how do you feel about it right now? Okay, so it's still the first year, which means it's a healthy dose of torture because it's <laughs> <laughs> just because, just because it's this big thing that I have to fit into my life and I have this very healthy career and then kids. So that's the torture is the not knowing. And then with this particular process, I'm not over managing it. Mm -hmm. I'm really allowing spirit to inform me, which is a really challenging thing to do with such a huge investment, right? Because it's very practical. There's cash, lots of it involved, but I've been very diligent to take my steps. So that's the hard part. Um, but that is like 10% and then there's 90% of excessive beauty. Mm. Um, so much 
so much uh, miracles, my own personal healing. I, it stretched me so far that an aspect of my, of my old self just kind of shattered. And, and it, was, it was very intense, but it was so beautiful. And it gave me access to another aspect of my own soul, of my own um, medicine, I guess. And so now when people come, oh, it's just been beautiful. Mm. Just beautiful. I'm about to cry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> great. It's been probably one of the most magical experiences of my life, but it also comes with its edge. Mm. Yeah. Had you finished the manuscript for Angel Wealth Magic when you found the place? Oh, yeah, I, had, I finished it. <laughs> Thank goodness, because I never <laughs> would have finished that book had I not... Had I not done that, yes, I finished it uh, probably about four months prior. No, I think it was two months before I actually found and bought the house. Because once, once it was a yes, and I kind of saw the mountain, it was like a, a big old uncle. Um, yeah, it didn't take long at all to find, find a property. The only reason I ask is it, it seems so connected to me that you would complete an offering like Angel Wealth Magic for the world, and then your own next thing comes in, because that's kind of how it works. You know, mm -hmm. it, you've, you've wrapped your energy and your voice and your spirit around sending this uh, transformation uh, vehicle out into the world, and so boom, in comes your next level of transformation. I, I love how that works in our lives. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't made that connection because I very much am just like, okay, what's next? Okay, let's go do it. That's and then, great. hey, what's that? All right, let's go. That's great. Um, but that one, yeah, it was a pretty rapid turnover. And so last year was, you know, Casa Condor year. And that that's what I call Casa it. Casa Condor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm still integrating, you mm. know, what this level, what this means and and who we are to become. When, when I say we, I mean me, the land, the home, and all the uh, beautiful people that will be called there, you know, beautiful. in one way or the other. Beautiful. So mm -hmm. yes, it's funny because you said, I'm a parent, I've got this thriving business, and now I've got a retreat center, because they are all their own they ecosystems are. and their own, you know, I always think of a, a business as a spiritual being, and it, it, it's connected to the audience or the people it serves, the people who work in it, you yourself, who may have been the founder or creator of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've just added a third one. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? I mean, my womb is stretched all. There's a lot of, a lot of babies. You're a super there. birther. Oh gosh, yeah. Still, we'll, we'll check back with you in a couple of years Please to do. see see how see how the the toddler years are going. <laughs> yes, um, it really is. Yes. It's it's interesting. You know, you've uh, you've touched on communicating with the mountain, mm -hmm. and I realize that I haven't really asked you about your process with um, being an intuitive and connecting to angels being a channeler connecting to angels and now connecting to mountain spirits and animal spirits. Mm -hmm. For you, was all of that available immediately or like many intuitives, has it been a process for you that you get a bit more intuitive and a bit more sensitive and a bit more able to communicate in a myriad of ways with a, with a myriad of things? Yes, I almost feel because it really cracked open with the angels. So I really was very focused on angel work but it almost feels like you do a certain, like for me, it's just, I'm almost like ambassadoring for, for angels. And then it's almost like another um, job, like a universal job opportunity to be an ambassador of a different um, aspect. And what I, I've been learning is really, it's almost like going around the wheel, like you're experiencing different aspects of who you are and your medicine and not just you, but all that is. Mm. And so I'm, you know, as I uh, open up more, I become also more aware, not of their separation, but of their union. And so, you know, the animal spirits are really speaking to me or I'm really, you know, um, experiencing them in a, at a whole other level now, um, but they have wings. So it's, the same, just in a different, different frequency, mm. a different vibration, closer to the earth to help people get almost to help me and to help other folks get even more anchor. Come to earth because this is where 
all the good stuff is happening. And there's so many of us that, oh, the spiritual world is somewhere hmm, out mm-hmm. there. And so my teaching now is really, here we are, where's the medicine? Brilliant. Yeah. So we're talking at the beginning of 2023. What sense do you have about 2023 and 2024 and what we as a world and as individuals might need mm. or might need to focus on mm. in, the, in the next year or two? Yeah. Um, there's a, for me, there's a new wave coming in. Uh, for me, last year was very internal uh, as far as um, bridging the gap between these paradoxes, being in this center almost not choosing the polar opposites, but inviting in that space of being able to be the binder between them and and doing this internal work, right? Like the shadow work, uh, the darker work and and embracing whatever that is, whatever that means for you. And especially whatever's, oh, I don't wanna go there. Um, it's almost like this alchemical process. Uh, and I feel that as, this year, so much of the work then becomes this integration of being receptive and active and masculine and, and feminine. And it's almost like this union between the energies. And I feel like we all have this opportunity to, to drop the, the false paradoxes and to really deepen into inner more layers of our heart, which is where we find peace um, not to sound cliche, but it's a real place inside of us, inside of all of us. And, and uh, the opportunities that I see as well is where the collective starts becoming more conscious of the, con- instead of the collective unconscious, the collective consciousness, where it's a very visceral awareness of our interconnection. And I, I feel like whatever path that we're on if you're hearing the call, we have an opportunity to let go of the, the projection of an enemy and really look at the demon within, whatever that is, and become, like for me, I wanna call in becoming masterful at bridging, being a bridge, mm. rather than building walls between other people. And we have to choose. We have to choose who we wanna be and what we're creating. So. I want to create more beauty and more bridges in the world between all beings. So it's help me be a bridge, you know, uh, a bridge spiritually, but also help people see themselves bridge deeper places inside of themselves with their personality. Um, So yeah, the whole wall thing and just stop with the building walls. What does it mean to be a bridge and staying in that place? Because it's easy to go into the, that game, that dance. Beautiful. And, and I, you know, again, not, not wanting to villainize anything either, but I feel and I have witnessed over the last few years a very obvious game of division that gets sown and encouraged and, you know, the, the flames of that get fanned. Yes. So what you're describing, being a bridge and being someone who can help yeah. bridge the two paradigms and not build walls is so crucial right now. Yes. Because I do think all of us, you know, my, I know this was my truth. It's through being around people who demonstrated that capacity to me, either how to bridge parts of myself, how to not be defensive to someone else. That's how I learned it. So I think, mm-hmm. yes, we can sit there and worry about the division in the world, or we can go, okay, well, there is division in the world right now. And it's always been there. It's just more surfaced than we perhaps are used to seeing it be so bold perhaps and so (laughs) encouraged so what's the what's the antidote to that it's like us us becoming more Mm -hmm. conscious and able to bridge in ourselves and with others and help others to find bridges where they want to put walls up exactly because we want to retreat when we when we are going through a planetary trauma all together at once there's a lot of traumatized people including ourselves the more aware that we become that we are walking around in traumatized bodies and consciousness, all of us. If we know that, perhaps there's room in our heart to have a little more compassion for the people acting out out of fear. The ones that we are really triggered by, uh, they're traumatized. Traumatized Mm -hmm. people behave very badly. So this helps me 
find the bridge inside of myself to have more compassion. Now, compassion does not, doesn't mean you tolerate bad behavior. I have mm. very strong boundaries as well. But if we approach each other with respect and honor, and instead of judging, be more curious about, so why is it do you feel that way? Or why do I feel this way? Curious about yourself first. Why am I so triggered? And obviously, there's really compelling reasons to be triggered, and they're valid. But what do I do about it? Do I choose to create more poison in here? or to, And this is what I, I've done. Ask spirit to help me find that bridge between sweeping it under the rug and over-identifying with it. Oh, just being so magnetized because darkness can be so magnetizing. It can suck you in. And so um, holding the space for something new and beautiful to emerge inside of ourselves that's more bridge-like mm. is totally possible. Uh, and I'm seeing it happen in, in the collective sphere. And I'm also seeing an elevation of consciousness and um, spiritual psychic power. Um, but I don't mean that in the, in the way where a lot of people want to, you know, escape to the fifth dimension. And go, you know, I mean it very much here, human to human. This is where the medicine is. I'm seeing the same thing. And it's kind of what? lovely because for years I would hear that through the channeled messages. But in the last couple of years, I'm... I'm, I'm able to track the evidence of what they're saying in a very grounded, real way. So I, I'm, I'm with really? you. Really? Oh, yeah. that's so good yeah. to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same. I like, <laughs> I like hearing that you're seeing it too. <laughs> <It's you>. uh, <laughs> see, it's yeah, happening. Yeah. <laughs> well, Corinne, it's been lovely to talk to you and thank you for <sighs> coming on. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you a final question, which is, Corinne Grillo, the angel experiment to angel wealth magic what next? <laughs> Party with the mountains. Uh, Party? Okay, yeah. is, that, is, is that the unofficial leak of the title of your next book? <laughs> well, there's so many beautiful things that are being con cooked in here right now. To me, the, the problem is, woo, how do you just choose one? Um, but yeah, what I can say is whatever it is, it will be different and it'll be beautiful. It'll also be a lot, lot uh, I would say, more deeper in a different way um yeah just more uh, yeah it's hard to explain but yes more beauty no that that makes sense because when i when i just you know tap into what i felt when you were describing the the mount shasta experience which feels like a whole new territory for you i'm like oh i'll be interested to see what she cooks up next <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, and as I'm saying that, there's this other edge coming too, because a lot of my work, again, is building bridges between myself where I'm experiencing these, I mean, I've experienced a lot of really cool stuff, miraculous stuff. What's coming in now is a whole different texture. Mm. It's surprising. It's beautiful. And also there's this other aspect that's coming in that is very... Um, no nonsense mm. and very uh, direct, honest, um, and probably could be triggering as well. You know, there's some deconstruction work. So, so I'm, you know, I, it's both. It'll be always be both. There'll be a paradox <laughs> walking side by side together. Beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I know I have just given the titles of two of your books, but you, you actually, you have courses, you have so much work available yeah. at your work site that's, the website that's ongoing. So, so for anybody who has enjoyed this conversation with Corinne and wants to know more about her and her work, you can go to corinnegrillo.com. Corinne, thank you so much for being here. You're a delight and it's been lovely to get to know you a bit more and to be in the presence of your energy. Oh yeah, you too. It's so great to see you finally. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and we will see you next time on Impact the World. Don't forget, we always put links to the show notes uh, in the show notes for Corinne's work and where you can find her latest book, Angel Wealth Magic. And if you are a fan of the show, means a lot to us. If you subscribe to the channel, leave a rating or a review, helps us find more like-minded people who might enjoy it. So thank you, see you next time. I hope you can join me for Rebirth 2023. This will be our sixth year of holding a Rebirth experience in January. And it's something that I originally created because I recognize that the end of a year and the beginning of a new year is a very potent and fertile time for us to let go of what we have walked through and call in what we would like to call in for the year ahead. 
So as well as practical and grounded guidance around how we do that and open to that, I also bring in my guides who will be very specifically working with the energy of 2023 and what we are about to walk into to help us center, ground, but also call in what it is that we want to next create. The rebirth experience is very multidimensional. We have everything from Qigong to dance, to channeling, to grounded teaching, to energy exercises, to meditations, to music. We try and bring you as much as we possibly can in as rounded an experience as we can offer so that you can really immerse yourself in one of the themes for this year, which is renew your soul. It's something we all need to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So a huge focus of Rebirth this year is renew your soul. And the other side of it is chart your path, helping you to map out the year that you're walking into with intention, with clarity, and with joy. So we look forward to you joining us for Rebirth 2023, where you can renew your soul and chart your path. Thank you.